There's actually, I, I haven't really talked a lot with Ken, but I know there's several connections between MSU and Ken, including former students here who have been inspired by his work, and a current student here who actually was a master for a, uh, uh, Randy Olson, who worked with Ken prior to coming here and working with Chris. So uh, uh, Ken's a, a leader in the field of understanding artificial neural networks that evolve, and I'll leave him to explain more. Thank you. Yeah, so I was very excited when I heard there might be an institute that puts evolution in a central position in the engineering of brains because that's what I've been trying to do. Um, so I'm going to try to make the case for why evolution does deserve uh, a prominent position when we think about building brains. So can artificial brains be engineered? Um, and if we're asking this question, then we're asking, you know, what will it take to reproduce the functionality of this amazing system in our heads? Uh, what are the algorithms behind intelligence, computational? And so there's many ways we could sort of roughly estimate how difficult this uh, goal might be to achieve, but uh, you know, just roughly looking at the number of connections in the human brain, 100 trillion, it's astronomically complex. So is this problem even tractable? And of course, there is this glimmer of hope, which is that many people believe that there are some principles that are more or less ubiquitous throughout the brain. And if that's true, if there are ubiquitous principles, then perhaps the same principles could be reused. Um, and often Mount Castle is cited here because he started to uh, propose this kind of idea. Um, and so it, this would be exciting because then you could have sort of a simple fundamental insight instead of having to set 100 trillion separate parameters. And then that insight might be possible to repeat across that substrate of the brain. And then you would be able to build the brain much easier um, than, say, optimizing 100 trillion parameters. And in fact, there are a lot of kind of hot, hot, hot ideas today uh, in, in uh, artificial intelligence, or artificial neural networks, in the building of brain-like systems that are ultimately inspired by what I would call this kind of uh, ubiquity hypothesis. Um, so stuff like deep learning, uh, which has to do with uh, certain types of deep structures that may appear throughout many different modalities uh, in the cortex. Uh, we just heard Jeff Hawkins talk uh, and his ideas. Um, value function reinforcement learning, uh, which uh, proposes that, uh, that uh, the ability to predict reward is ultimately behind much of what we think of as intelligent behavior. Um, and uh, all of these sort of have this idea that a lot of intelligence can be explained by some kind of fundamental principle. Um, and I do want to clarify that I, nobody, I don't think anybody actually believes that there's just, just one principle and then, you know, it's just everything is exactly the same throughout the brain. It's just going to be that simple. I mean, nobody is suggesting something that uh, simplistic. But the general idea that there are these kind of fundamental principles, and if we can identify them, that we really propel ourselves forward and open up the possibilities that is behind a lot of this, these advances, and these are important advances. But there is a potential problem, and this is where evolution may play a role. And I want to illustrate this problem with an argument that I'll call the fingers of the hand problem, the fingers of the hand argument. So this is a little bit easier than engineering brains, engineering hands. What if we're trying to build a hand? And then I could ask the question, what is the key principle behind the hand? all the things, what is making a hand a hand? And, I, and actually, I thought about this, and I came up with the answer. It's a finger. So this is, this is really important because a finger, you know, all, once you get the idea of a finger, you just basically need to repeat that. And, and in our hands, it's five times. Um, and so this is kind of the ubiquity hypothesis, which helped to illustrate this idea. Um, just make five fingers, and you get a hand. Um, and, but, so I can do that. Um, and the question is, how have I solved the problem of the hand? In case your brain isn't yet registering, this looks a little bit wrong. Um, that's not a hand. Uh, a hand looks a little bit different um, because your fingers are not all the same. And the problem is that the principle alone is not sufficient to really solve the problem of what a hand is. Because beyond the principle, there is repetition with variation or variation on a theme. And this tends to be how biological systems are set up. This is actually the principle that nature really loves to exploit when it builds complex systems, is variation on a theme. There's the principle, and then there's how the principle varies. And both are critical. And we tend to focus on discovering the principles 
without thinking about the problem that the principles probably need to vary across the substrate of whatever it is that's being engineered. And so I'm saying that this is nature's favorite trick. Um, and I want to give you some, some argument for why that is. Um, I mean, the hand is just one example, but uh, think about the vertebrae of your spine. Each one is uh, very similar to the others, but none are exactly identical. They're all variations on a theme. Those are pictures of limbs. They're not the same limb. One is a leg, one is an arm. Both have muscles, bone, joints. They're variations on the theme of a limb. Um, they're not the same thing, but they're also not different things. Um, all kinds of things in the body are like this. Skin, skin varies across your body. It's not uniform, you probably notice when you're looking at your skin. Hair varies across the body. Even the hair on, on the top of your scalp actually varies in terms of the exit angle from your head uh, as you move across the geometry of the scalp. So this is nature's favorite trick. And of course the brain is going to be no exception. Do you really think you know, that across these 100 trillion connections, you're going to actually repeat the same principle in exactly the same way? Of course, the nature will exploit the ability to vary its principles, which it always does, and it will be no less true inside of a brain. You know, you think that all of these areas are exactly the same. And, you know, unfortunately, this isn't really a good question, and we often talk in sort of this binary way of where, you know, is everything the same or is everything different? You know, we could take sides, but the, the truth is they're neither the same nor different. It's not one or the other. It's that the principles tend to be uniform, but they tend to vary across uh, the entire structure. Um, so it's sort of both. And so uh, in the brain, of course, you're going to see that kind of manifestation as well. And the subtlety of that variation is fundamental to the operation of such a complex structure. Um, so you might say, well, okay, maybe this is sort of a, a general argument for variation across all biological structures, but why in the brain in particular Shouldn't it be uniform? I mean, some people would hypothesize that perhaps differentiation among cortical structures could be explained through plasticity. In other words, they sort of start out the same when you're young, when you're born, but over time, they differentiate. Um, so, so then maybe that would explain why we have sort of differences in different, different areas, but it's really not that the principles are fundamentally different. But there's good reason to believe, and we know enough to say, that probably these areas wouldn't be uniform, at least if, if someone was trying to design the optimal machine that would actually use some kind of semi-uniform principles. Because after all, we know that all learning algorithms are sensitive to initial bias. The initial setup of the system is going to impact the ultimate trajectory that the system takes. And like a really simple example, if you just think about an artificial neural network to be like sort of the initial weights of the system. You take a, a particular neural network and you initialize it with a certain pattern of weights, it will come out to a different endpoint or end state as a neural network that was initialized with a different set of weights, even if they both experienced the exact same experiences over the course of their lifetime, because of the uh, initial bias. Um, and so initial bias plays an important role um, in, in, in biasing uh, different uh, algorithms towards where they might ultimately end up. And you can imagine that that's something that nature could exploit or evolution could exploit. It doesn't even have to solve problems explicitly. It just has to move things a little bit in the right direction in order to get them to be biased towards that particular modality for which they were uh, constructed. Um, things like geometry and topographic maps. I mean, we have a lot of topographic maps in the head. We have a retinotopic map. We have a somatotopic map. And there's all kinds of topic in, in, in the brain. And these structures basically capture some kind of isomorphism between the geometric structure of the connectivity of the neurons in that map and the geometric structure of the uh, sensory area uh, or the sensory uh, receptors from which they receive input. Um, and that kind of geometric correlation is important, of course, for ultimately allowing the system to fully leverage um, the uh, particular uh, details of that particular sensory modality. Um, and of course, that's something that you would get from evolution, and even with the same principle, starting out with that kind of geometric isomorphism is a helpful initial starting point. And finally, another other thing I could, I could throw in there is the parameters of learning itself. Things like how fast uh, connections change in weight, um, synaptic plasticity. There are implicit parameters you know, in a biological system which determine how it changes over time. And you would expect that those parameters don't have to be uniform across the surface of the entire brain.
Um, and certainly, if they don't have to, then you, they could serve one modality more than another depending on their settings. It may be different in terms of sort of how fast you want certain areas to uh, respond to stimuli uh, in terms of changing their weights as others. And so, there are good reasons to believe that it would be useful if there was some kind of variation on, even if there is some kind of semi-uniform theme, that there's some variation as we exploit that theme across the modalities of life. So, this suggests that you can have a sort of an alternative method for engineering brains. The conventional thing is to say, let's start with some principles, and then we'll just worry later about how it varies, because that's just the details. And I'm not, I'm not by any means trying to dismiss this, what I'm saying, the conventional approach, because the contributions that come from uncovering these principles are fundamental and important towards understanding how we're eventually going to get there. But what I'm saying is that there is an alternative that we should also be pursuing, that is also fundamentally important at the same level as being able to discover these principles, which is to learn how to encode variation on a theme. How does variation on a theme manifest through some kind of search process? Um, because that is the trick that ultimately will allow us to exploit these principles to their fullest. And uh, if you think about it, this is a very uh, deep problem. Um, because it's one thing to say, let's find a principle and then, tell, and then describe that principle. It's another thing to say, I will describe the space of all possibilities that is created by the principle. In other words, what you want to be able to do if you're going to be doing variation on a theme and that theme is centered on some principle is you need to be able to describe the space of all possibilities that surround that principle. In other words, the dimensions of variation of the principle itself. And as humans, this is not our greatest talent. We tend not to be that good at that. We, we write down principles, theorems, and things like that, but we don't tend to think about how principles vary or describe them in some kind of encoding that's convenient for varying. And if you think about it, it's like if you came down from an alien planet and, and I showed you one finger, like the pointer finger, I said, look at this. Imagine what you could do with this. Who would ever have the genius to think of a thumb? Because a thumb is a very strange finger. Um, and so the, the artist that sort of has the conception that within the space of fingers, there's this very strange thing called a thumb, that's, a, that's an ingenious insight. And that is enabled by some kind of encoding, some kind of parameterization of the space that surrounds that principle. And in fact, there is a field that studies this, how you can encode spaces, search spaces. Um, and this field is, in, is, a, is, is often inside of uh, evolutionary computation, it's a subfield of evolutionary computation, which calls itself generative and developmental systems. Um, and the particular focus is on what's called indirect encodings, and, and DNA could be considered to be an indirect encoding. It's not the only possible indirect encoding, it's an indirect encoding, an indirect mapping from genes to ultimate expression of some kind of structure of the phenotype. And if we study how these kinds of encodings can work, how we can express something like variation on the theme, then this capability can paint the perfect pattern later. In other words, we can exploit it once we understand it in order to learn how to exploit ultimately the principles that we are relying on to build our uh, complex system. So evolution is a master of varying themes. And, uh, it's, you can think of it as an artist of exquisite precision, I mean, when you look at the fingers of the hand. Um, and so, of course, it is going to be a tool for exploiting this capability as we learn about it. So, what I'm going to do with the second half of this uh, talk, I'd like to just give you an example in direct encoding. Um, and uh, there, there are more than one uh, people have been developing these for, for a, it's a long time now. Um, but I'm going to show you one, uh, of course, from my own research group uh, called Compositional Pattern Producing Networks, and just give you, hopefully, a taste of why it's interesting to explore this uh, kind of problem of encoding. Um, and uh, so Compositional Pattern Producing Network, or CPPN for short, um, is what it is is a high level abstraction of how embryos are encoded through DNA. The key word here is high level. Um, this isn't a low level chemical simulation. This is going to try to extract the the high level explanation of what is going on that allows such amazing, exquisite kinds of molding as something like developing the fingers of the hand. And uh, the idea is uh, to exploit function composition uh, to produce patterns that exhibit repetition and variation. So in other words, the, the hypothesis that's being advanced here is that function composition 
captures at a fundamental level some important property of what happens when DNA is translated into a phenotype. And even though functional composition is such an abstract, it's a very simple mathematical principle, uh, and it's such an abstract idea compared to sort of how DNA encodes a phenotype, we'll see that it actually can be exploited to yield results that at some level are analogous. Um, and so another nice aspect of CPBNs, which is the encoding I'm about to show you, is that we can evolve them with an evolutionary algorithm, which is called Neuroevolution of Augmenting Topologies of NEAT, which comes from my own dissertation work. Um, because NEAT is designed to evolve networks, and it turns out that this encoding itself is a network. So in other words, there's a convenient algorithm already that will allow us to look at what it's like to search through the space of possible CPBN representations. So just to give you a little bit of detail, and, and I, I obviously don't have time to go through lots of detail, but I'll give you a little bit of the detail um, just so you have a sense of what's going on here. Think of a CPPN as a function. Um, and we would think of it as a function of, uh, of uh, x and y. Um, and x and y can be thought of as, as the axes, the, the major body axis. Think about the, the thing that we're going to be creating as a phenotype. Um, and so basically, what we're going to do is just say, this takes x and y's input, and then we're just going to uh, graph the output in a plane. So this is really simple. You can just say graph the function, basically. It's a two-dimensional image. But think of that two-dimensional image as a phenotype. And if you think about it that way, then you can think about this as sort of a, oops, as a high-level analogy for uh, DNA, um, in the sense that the DNA sort of takes, takes the, the, the major axes of the universe, or of space, <coughs> and then uh, map some kind of body morphology across those axes. Um, and so uh, this is basically what we're saying is a way of thinking abstractly about what an encoding does in, 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 in terms of producing a body or a brain, which is a pattern in space. And so internally now, what will we you do to constitute this function? Internally, this is what this CPPN looks like, or this pattern producing network looks like. And it is itself a network. And at every node in that network is a particular function, but it's a simple function. And these are sometimes, in the world of neural networks, they'd be called activation functions. But in CPPN, they're basically simple functions, um, like, a, like, a, like a periodic function, or a symmetric function, like a sine or a Gaussian, uh, or an asymmetric function. Uh, it could, be, could have been a sigmoid or something like that. But basically what it does is it composes simple functions. You're saying, OK, so basically we're just going to graph whatever this composition of functions, and basically the network represents which functions are composed with which. So for example, this, this, the output of this uh, symmetric function is being fed into the input of this symmetric function, or the output of this asymmetric function goes into the input of that periodic function, and, uh, and the connections will be weighted. So it's very much like a neural network in terms of its functionality. But it's not a neural network, and I don't want you to think of it as a neural network. It really is intended to be an abstraction of how an embryo develops. And let me show you why you can think of it this way, because it seems rather strange to say this is how an embryo develops. But you can think of it this way in an abstract sense, because what is the first thing that happens uh, in the development of uh, an embryo, say, from the initial fertilized egg? And what it is is basically you have to lay out the major body axis. So like the x, y, z, or where's the head and where's the tail? Where's the front, where's the back? Where's left, where's right? And those are defined by chemical gradients, chemical gradients that ultimately are, are laid out in that very early embryo. And you can think of X and Y here as, the, as, the, as those initial body axis gradients. So think of these as chemical gradients rather than thinking of it sort of mathematically. We lay a gradient along X, we lay a gradient along Y. Now, upon those gradients, when an embryo develops, there will be other gradients laid. For example, to get the symmetry of the body, the body's not perfectly symmetric, but to get the pseudo-symmetry of the body, there has to be, at some point, a symmetric gradient laid. Um, and so you can think of these compositions as basically laying gradients upon gradients. So if you feed something like the x-axis into a, into, a, into a symmetric function, what you're getting is a symmetric gradient along x. And then within, with situated within that coordinate system now, because basically the gradient provides a new coordinate system, now you can get other gradients that are going to now be sort of symmetric, but also now offer their particular shape. So for example, when a periodic gradient here feeds into a symmetric gradient here, what you're going to get is segments with opposite polarities. You get segmentation with opposite 
Um, and so basically what you can think of it as is this is a sequence of developmental events, and some of them happen in parallel, some of them in sequence, um, starting from the bottom and going to the top, and then the output is the final phenotypic form. And what's nice about it is that we describe the regularities and symmetries explicitly inside of the network um, as it's built from the bottom. And so one of the other great things about this is that it has a, a good theory of where you get repetition with variation. You get it from having periodic coordinate frames like this combined with aperiodic ones. In other words, we have both the sense of symmetry in the body and a sense of asymmetry at the same time. And simply combining those mathematically gives you patterns that exhibit this idea of repetition variation. So like this. So these are CPPN generated patterns. They're actually generated the output of CPPN. You see they're really cool because what they do is they have, it's like a wallpaper with a repeating motif and you can see it's like the same motif at every, at every point. Except that at the nexus of each one of these is a unique pattern, every one of them. And it turns out that it's very easy because of this function composition property of CPPN to generate all kinds of patterns that have this property. So these are just some other, it's a gallery of other CPPN generated patterns uh, which have this property. You see the repetition with variation, you know, sort of like this almost cellular connected like kind of uh, pattern here, uh, reminiscent maybe even of sort of brain like patterns. And, you know, we're going to get to that. How can you actually make a brain out of something like this? Um, but first, what I want to show you just for intuition is a kind of interesting way to explore uh, CPPN space. If you want to get a sense of like what is this space like that CPPNs uh, are, are creating. And so to do that, we can do what's called interactive evolution, which means we'll do breeding just like you would breed horses or, or dogs or something like that. We'll breed CPPNs. So what I show on the screen here are 15 CPPNs. And this is actually their output. So this is, if you take random CPPNs, so we combine just a few random nodes with, with, with activation functions from, from the set that I described, um, and then just sort of uh, draw the picture that they, that they described. This is basically what they look like. Now, I could, I could breed them by saying, okay, which one do I like? Maybe I like that one. So that'll be a parent. So now I'm going to have it have children by slightly mutating its underlying CPPN or its underlying DNA. So there's children. And so I can say, okay, well, that's, that's interesting. This one developed some kind of new innovation. So let's see what happens if I go with that. So I'll take that, go to the next. That, those are its children. So they're literally children of the one that I chose. That I chose there. And so we can just continue doing this. And basically what we're doing then is we're, we're exploring CPPN space. This is the space of things that are uh, represented by, by a, a network like this. And one of the important things is that over time, these CPPNs can get more complex. More nodes and more connections can be added in through mutation. So the phenotypic structure that they describe is getting more and more complex. So what do you think would happen if you played this game uh, for a long time? You know, you keep selecting things, going to the next, selecting things, going to the next. What do you think you'd find out there, out in CPPN space? And I want to show you, and I think it's really kind of remarkable, is you can find this. Now this looks like an art gallery, but it's not an art gallery. These are not created by artists. All of these are completely produced by CPPNs. They're all just function compositions. There's nothing else going on here, including the color. Um, these were discovered uh, by users of this website we put up called Pick Reader, um, and where we just let people come in from the internet and breed CPPNs to see what they could find. And they found all these things. Um, of course, there's just a small subset of some of the things they found. But, I mean, I think this is amazing, and hopefully you also think this is, these are quite remarkable. Um, this is not obvious that this would happen. Um, you know, that we have stuff like a skull, uh, a car, a butterfly. Uh, there's Jupiter with its red spot. Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this gives you a sense that there, this, we are capturing some natural aspect of encoding at a very high level of abstraction that this actually is happening. Um, and you can see, uh, once again, repetition with variation, variation on the theme in here. Now, clearly, some things like this, this butterfly is actually not perfectly symmetric, but almost is. And you can be certain that the left wing here is not encoded with completely separate information, genetically speaking, from the right. Of course they share information. But same with the left side of this car and the right side of this car. I mean, the car has to be asymmetric or it wouldn't be a car. But you can be sure that the right side is not a completely independent part from the left side from a, in terms of what information encodes that structure or you know, the, the tentacles of this octopus, or look at the turrets of this castle and so forth. And we'll see repetition with variation all over the place. 
Um, and so this is a natural property of these types of function composition based structures. And so this is interesting, you know, because we could do this. It's kind of surprising you know, that people would find things like that. But really what would be interesting, I mean, you didn't come here to see an art show. What you want to see is, can we use this to build brains? And the answer is that, you know, if you look at, if you look at some gallery like this, you know, you might say, well, that's really nice and all, but I don't really see where this is going in terms of doing anything useful. But if you look at it like that, it's short-sighted because a pattern is just a pattern. I mean, these are patterns in space. Your brain is also a pattern in space. But these are spatial patterns. Your brain is a connectivity pattern. But a connectivity pattern ultimately is also just a spatial pattern. If I have a generic pattern generator, which is what I have, and if I can generate interesting patterns in space, then I can generate patterns of any type. So I should be able to use these principles to generate brain-like patterns. So it evolve CPPNs that encode space, that encode uh, neural networks, basically, that have these uh, non-uniform type of regularities. And so how can that be done? And it turns out that uh, just for a while we were, we were trying to figure this out, but it turned out a really simple principle allows you to do this. Um, and it's called the hypercube based need. So that's where this word hypergeek comes from. And the reason is because what we realized is that uh, the, the, the relationship between a spatial pattern and a connectivity pattern is just that you have to multiply its dimensionality times two. Because if you think about it, if I'm trying to generate a pattern in space that's a spatial pattern in two dimensional space, then in order to get the, say, ink level of a point, then I would need to query an xy point and ask, well, what's the ink level at that point? Well, what is the analogous thing you have to do with a connectivity pattern, say, like a connectivity pattern in two-dimensional space? Well, you have, to, you, have to get, you have to query two points because you need x1, y1, x2, y2. In other words, you need the position of the source node and the target node that are being connected. And then I can ask uh, the pattern generator for the weight that connects them or any other parameter you might be interested in. It doesn't have to just be the weight. Um, and so, uh, basically, I need four dimensions, and that, that's why you see these here, x1, y1, x2, y2. Four dimensions is the amount of space, basically, that I need to describe a connectivity pattern, to describe a pattern across some kind of connectivity that connects nodes in two dimensions. And similarly, like it says here, a three-dimensional connectivity pattern could be produced through a six-dimensional CPPN. So I need six dimensions to do that. Um, so it can be done. And so basically what's going on is that you're really, if, if you have a, a CPPN like this, and it takes in four inputs instead of just the two that were, that were there originally, uh, you're just painting a spatial pattern inside of a hypercube. That's all you're doing. Um, and those spatial patterns have the same irregularities, symmetries, and same variations on themes that you saw in, in, in the uh, two-dimensional case. It's just that it'll be in four dimensions. But the great thing is that the connectivity pattern, if you draw it, it will be isomorphic to the pattern in that hypercube. In other words, you get the same symmetries and regularities in the connectivity pattern. And so we have the ability to generate massive connectivity patterns because this, these are mathematical functions that can be drawn at any scale. There's no limit to the resolution, which in other words, in connectivity means there's no limit to the density. So I can now do this in connectivity. And so these are just like if you're playing pick reader with, with CPPNs on connectivity now. You get all these properties. You can see symmetry and repetition and variation and so forth. These are actually CPPN generated connectivities. And like I said, you can do it in three dimensions too, um, where it's more kind of interesting since that's like our brain. These, these are images produced by Jeff Clinton, really nice images. I thought these are CPPN generated connectivity patterns. They're actually used to control things uh, that were evolved with hyper um, But you can see inside of them, you have these kind of patterns like repetition different kinds of symmetries, you even have exceptions and so forth. So it has the ability to create all of these types of uh, patterns, but now inside of the connectivity of brain-like structures where there is no limit to the resolution or the density uh, over which we could uh, map this type of pattern. So millions of more connections are, are possible and actually structures have been evolved to that size. So the last thing I wanted to do was just show you one example of using it to do something. So there's a lot of applications that, that have been applied to uh, this hyperlink, but I'll show you with checkers, because checkers, I think, is, 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 is easy to understand how there's some geometric regularity in the game. In other words, like getting uh, captured or being threatened with capture is, is pretty much a, a similar concept at every square on the board, except that it's not exactly the same, you know, depending on if you're on the edge or in the middle and so forth. 
So certainly, there, if you imagine a connectivity pattern that maps from the geometry of the checkerboard to some hidden layer and then makes a decision, basically this is actually a board evaluator, then you would expect that there would be some uh, repetition of variation across the geometry of this connectivity pattern. Or you would even get kind of a topographic map of the game of checkers. So this is like a, about a 4,000 connection uh, network that, will, that was evolved to play checkers. Um, and now it's with hypernate, so it's generating as a pattern and it actually has a geometry because of that, which is unlike most neural network, most artificial neural network learning algorithms. It's real geometry, which is based on the geometry of the checkers board. So I could show you some you know, results that say, you know, hybrid is better than method X and, and you know, everybody's really happy and, and this is impressive, but you've seen stuff like that and you don't really learn that much from that. So I'm not gonna end like that. Rather, I think what's more interesting is to look inside the evolved brains and see if we can learn something the way like a neuroscientist might do by looking inside of these artificially evolved brains about the checkers players themselves. So what I wanted to show you was, I think it's kind of interesting, is if you look at, um, uh, the, we can actually visualize the map that's created uh, that, that uh, projects out of the input layer uh, to the hidden layer here um, by looking at influence maps that come out of individual nodes in this evolved network. So in other words, like what I'm saying here is that if there's a yellow circle here, it means that this whole pattern is the pattern of weights that's projected out of here, out of this source node, in other words, out of here. And it basically, it, I'm showing the weights as colors and they are, uh, they are mapped to and matched to the actual geometry of this structure. So you can see the actual weight pattern emanating from this node. Here's the weight pattern emanating from this node, the weight pattern emanating from that node. And we can see these now. So, so this is just a way of sort of seeing the influence maps that are coming out. Now, the geometry matters here because if you remember, the CPPN is, is generating this pattern as a function of the geometry. So it's not like a typical neural network. You actually have a geometry inside of the connectivity pattern. And what was interesting, and, and what I want to show you, is that we actually were able, we actually discovered when we looked at different players that we can tell just looking at their brain whether they're going to be a general player. Or not. And uh, this is a really uh, uh, unexpected type of discovery that you can actually look at a neural network and know how good it is. But we found that you can. Now, in terms of what I mean by a good player, I mean these players were trained to defeat a single opponent, basically. And all of them learn to defeat it. Each one of these squares here is, is, a, is a different player in all these cases. So all of these can defeat the opponent they were trained to defeat. But some were better at playing against other opponents after training was over, after evolution was over, than others. So some are more general. And so we said, let's look at the, the brains of the general ones and the brains of the less general ones. And so we look at the influence map patterns. And you can see, I mean, anybody here could tell me who's going to be general or less general just by looking at them, seeing this. You can see that the, 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 the key to generality is smoothness. And less general, you get this jaggedness across the geometry. And it makes sense if you think about it. This is a sign of what? This is a sign of memorization. In other words, these individuals are showing the particular, um, the particular spatial uh, anomalies that correspond to specific aspects of the game they learned to play against that one opponent. Um, and so it's very irregular. Whereas these have basically somehow, luckily, uh, learned a more general notion of the game of checkers itself. And so you can see that the geometry really matters and the patterns that are generated matters. And one danger is that if you have a directly encoded learning algorithm, you have a really high susceptibility to generating patterns that are jagged like this. Because there's no holistic view of the overall pattern. Nothing is looking at it from the overarching sort of encoding perspective. So you're unlikely to get these type of things, but look at these type of things, the type of things are quite effective. And you also see that in all of these, repetition and repetition with variation are fundamental to the strategies that have been developed. These are patterns emanating from specific nodes in the input layer, and you can see that they're variations on each other, variations on a theme, quite similar to each other. Usually they're spatial shifts of some kind of weight pattern theme, but they're not perfect, weight, uh, perfect shifts either. Like the, the pattern that's being shifted is not exactly the same even as it's being shifted in different different, uh, coming out of different nodes. So it is exploiting repetition with variation as it is uh, learning to play the game of checkers. So let me just conclude. Um, there's been a lot of hypernet applications, a lot of control applications. Uh, people have done uh, uh, real robot control, visual discrimination. There have been uh, networks evolved with millions of connections, which is probably one of the largest networks evolved at the time. Let me give, so broader implications. Um, 
this is not just about connectivity. It's not just about wave patterns in space, because these patterns could be anything. They don't have to just be weights or typical weights in just simple traditional neural networks. It could be any parameters for any purpose. Um, but in a bigger sense, the, the point is that it's not that this replaces the principles that we may discover in other contexts. Like, you know, we have important learning principles that people have discovered um, or, 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 or introduced uh, for training neural networks. Rather, this could be synergistic. In other words, if we understand the principles and we also understand how to search through possible variations on those themes, then this could be a partner to those types of methodologies in order to really get, to really extract their ultimate potential. Because ultimately, we will have to vary the principle. You can't just have a uniform principle across the whole subject and expect to get as good performance as a varying principle. All of these can be distributed in some kind of meaningful topographic pattern. So the moral of the story, and this is the last slide, is that discovering a principle is useful. Of course we want to discover principles. But discovering how to vary the principle is harder because it's not the kind of thing humans are good at. We are not good at thinking about how to represent the dimensions of variation of the principle. What are the possible manifestations? And yet that is exactly what evolution is good at. Evolution uh, is, is the master of doing that kind of variation. Because no matter how elegant the finger, only the most brilliant artist would from it shape a thumb. And evolution is that artist, and we're going to need it. Thank you. Okay, we us up just a tiny bit. Not all the way, so we're going to have to have a shortened uh, coffee break, but let's take a, a, another minute or two for uh, some questions. Tom, right back. Um, so suppose you, you uh, got Hyperneat to learn to play checkers, and um, you discovered that it had one of these jagged memorization patterns. Um, would, I've got two questions about that. Would there be a way to predict in advance or from its very earliest um, outputs that it was going to turn out that way? And then if it did, could you do anything to turn it into a more general kind of representation with some more practice or by putting in some extra inputs or something? Yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that probably is feasible. I mean, that has to do with the, the structure of the search space. You know, there's the space of possible brains. Is, and early on, it probably is true, actually, that we commit to sort of one path or the other, like the less general or the more general path, um, and, and that we just don't realize we've made this wrong commitment. But once you have, I mean, you can get better and better and better playing against that one opponent, but you've already committed to kind of this less general strategy, and, and you're probably doomed at that point. So if we could intervene early and sort of detect that problem, probably we could say this is actually not the path we want to go down. But this is always the problem with search algorithms. It's sort of a stepping stone problem. You know, we, we may know where we want to ultimately go, but we don't know what the stepping, star, stepping stones are to get there. And all that this shows is that one particular case in one particular search space where there probably are some deceptive stepping stones that look really good but actually aren't. And now that we've identified this, you know, probably there's a lot of things we can do to preempt it, but only because now we're aware of it. Part of that is, is, you know, can we use the this kind of generic ability to evolve sort of brain scale networks and somehow, somehow to understand our own brains or other brains? And, yeah, I mean, I think in, in, in terms of this kind of artificial neuroscientist thing, which I, I gave a little taste of there, maybe it can give us some sense. You know, I don't think that I would have had the insight that sort of jaggediness and the geometric pattern itself is somehow predictive of some kind of performance. And maybe there are discoveries like that 
as the things that we evolved become more natural in terms of actually having geometries and having those kind of natural properties, that actually can then feed back into neuroscience and give us some hypotheses at least. Um, but on the, the other side of it is that it's possible that it can help us to build brains beyond just only using evolution, because once we discover some of these principles through evolution, um, we then can manipulate them as, as engineers and sort of say, well, let's play with this idea now that we see this. Um, and we don't have to always just subscribe only to what evolution outputs. Um, so I think it, it offers something sort of at both ends of the spectrum. Okay, but uh, so you use these uh, evolutionary algorithms to develop the connection patterns in, in, the, in the default frames. Uh, but as Jeff pointed out in his talk, and we know that most of the connections in actual frames are learned during the, the cognitive development or the learning time. Yeah. So have you or some other people looked at the, the, the mixture of evolution and, and the, the development and learning? Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of glazed over here where the actually uh, one of the, so this is just a way of mapping some kind of uh, uh, parameter over space. And it, it, in, in a lot of what I was talking about was a weight. And so you're pointing out that that's just a static structure. But a real, you know, a real cognitive system is not static, it's plastic. And so it would be changing over time. But there's nothing to prevent us from outputting the parameters of plasticity itself or any kind of other kind of dynamic system. Um, and in fact, uh, this has been done. So CPPNs have been used to produce learning rules at every connection instead of just producing a single static weight. And then that becomes a dynamic system. In fact, the CPPN itself can encapsulate an entire dynamic system where every single connection has a unique dynamic aspect to it. Um, and so it's really quite general in terms of what it can do because all it's doing is just projecting a pattern across space. And that pattern we can use for any purpose that we want. So anything that might be a pattern, which is it's a philosophical question whether everything's a pattern, but I, I would, I would uh, you know, guess that everything is a pattern. Anything that can be described as a pattern can be projected through some kind of pattern generator. Okay, we should uh, break there. Um, I'm going to suggest.